So Rio Tinto has hired a cultural awareness coach. We are going to learn more about this this episode. Episode number 250, 250, a momentous occasion. I think I joined this podcast around episode 143, 144. And yeah, those those people, I, I wonder if they're still out there that listened to this podcast from way back then, because I sure hope so. And it would mean a lot to me. I mean, I was just trying to make deadline recording from a phone. And then as, as I started out as the temporary podcast host, and uh, it's been a great ride. And I have to say, I recommend this kind of thing to everybody. I really do. Like, there's nothing like having to deliver a one hour or 45 minute pre on a weekly basis, you inevitably get better at speaking. And when you get better at speaking, you become a happier person. You become a happier, more confident person. So I highly recommend it. You know, I wish I did this in high school. I probably would have been a happier kid. And, you know, I had a lot of, you know, anxiety. You know, I probably could have used a coaching. And back to this Rio Tinto cultural sensitivity coach. Is that what they call it? Cultural awareness coach. Um, You know what's interesting about coaching? I was thinking about coaching as I was making coffee for this episode. And you, you know what coaching, like I'm a huge fan of coaching, actually. Like I say half in jest, uh, you know, Rio Tinto uh, needing a cultural awareness coach, but I'm actually a huge fan of coaching. And you know what coaching has kind of, the void that it's filled, according to my personal coffee thoughts, practical ethics. They don't teach practical ethics in school anymore. And it's almost like coaching, which is kind of, you know, what's at the core of coaching? Values. And it's almost as if coaching has replaced practical ethics. How to act. When I was in high school, I didn't know how to act. I was a particularly anxious kid, and we're just about to get to our real broadcast here. But on episode 250, we can take a few seconds here. I was an anxious kid, and uh, it would have been just the greatest thing in the world. There's two things I could have done that would have made me a happier teenager. One, something like this, uh, giving, having to give a, an hour-long, 45-minute-long public presentation, pre of whatever kind, doing that kind of thing. The other thing would be going to the gym. I think that is so good for kids. And I just didn't realize, I didn't know that that's the sort of thing that would make me actually happy. I just figured, well, I'm just not really interested in that. You know, give me my Velvet Underground and my Robert Crumb comics or whatever, right? I wanted to be cool and really going to the gym wasn't particularly cool. Anyway, welcome to the episode Rio Tinto, it's it's kind of a, you know, again, they're like the second biggest mining company. They are killing it. I mean, I wonder after this latest earnings call how close they're getting to be the biggest because they're giving back a $9.1 billion dividend and they're crushing it. Now, they talk about this new lithium project that's in Serbia. You know, it was interesting because they give a lot of lip service, shall we say, or a lot of credence to ESG and how they want to have impeccable credentials. And yet they don't talk about any of these protests that are happening in this lithium project in Serbia, the Yater project. And so I found that to be a bit of an incongruity. Maybe it has to do with the cultural awareness coaching that Put it this way, if you want to have impeccable ESG credentials, then I don't think you run away from issues. In that Yater mine news story, like it to me, like what I read is that they're going to turn it into a referendum. And this wasn't mentioned at all. So I don't know if that builds credibility. That's my only sort of reservation on that. Otherwise, sounds great. And congratulations on crushing your profits there. Uh, but as we know with Rio Tinto, it's always they have a uh, they've had a lot of troubles in the last couple of years. Like I mean, there's no hiding it. 
And they talk a little bit about ESG at the start, just barely anything. And this is an edited conference call. I edited it for you. Thank me later. I mean, you don't need to, again, hear about every nook and cranny of the conference call and of earnings. I do that for you. And yeah, so they put it at the end. And I think from a symbolic perspective, that also doesn't impress from, and I'm being hard on Rio Tinto, but I'm just being honest. These are my thoughts. Why are you putting all this ESG and the community stuff and license to operate at the very end of the call? Because to me, that also that becomes, again, like it starts to just raise questions about, well, do they really mean it? If, if it's, maybe it's not a priority. Maybe by putting money at the very start, maybe it's not the, maybe money is still the priority. And I'm not going to fault them for that. They're a profit uh, driven corporation in a world that they didn't invent. But the mood of the times is really that you are going to uh, benefit communities, right? And further, if you're going to bring it up and say you want impeccable ESG credentials, I would think, like, say, a Mark Bristow or almost everybody, you start with ESG and you stick with ESG and you say everything you need to say about ESG. You don't give a couple of lines on ESG at the start and then dump it all at the end after an extended earnings uh, report from your CFO. Just some style analysis from me. Uh, take it for what it's worth. You may have a different view. So turning to the markets, we have a bit of a warning signal. This warning signal from the 10-year bond continues. Yesterday, the U.S. 10-year bond was at 1.15%. Today, it jumped back up to 1.19%. But we are continuing to see a decline in U.S. bond yields, specifically the 10-year. So again, like how do we read this? Like, If memory serves, before the COVID crash, bond yields really started to drop, but the market was at all-time highs. Again, feel free to leave a comment. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember everybody was talking about the inverted yield curve, and that was going to predict a recession, and then there was a big debate about that because the market was at an all-time high and we didn't see anything. And then sure enough, there was the recession of all recessions with COVID. We shut down the economy. So it actually did deliver, again, if memory serves, but I'm pretty sure that's what happened. You'd probably remember that too. So it feels like a very similar situation, doesn't it? But what's remarkable about that situation is when the market's at all-time highs, it doesn't feel like it's going to crash. It feels impossible for it to crash, which probably means it might. So just, you know, stuff I think about. But yeah, those bond yields... It's going to be really interesting, isn't it? The next two months, three months, let's see if anything happens. Maybe nothing happens and they just are, uh, they go down. But it, to me, this is the sort of thing where sentiment is buoyant. We have all-time highs and yields are dropping. If you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. You can find us on Instagram at the Northern Miner. And on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Apple Podcasts. And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, we have a story on mining.com. The headline, Global Copper Supply at Risk as Workers Vote to Strike. This definitely turned my head. A tightening global copper market. And this is by Bloomberg News, which you can get uh, mining stories from Bloomberg on mining.com. A tightening global copper market is facing the real possibility of simultaneous strike disruptions at three mines in Chile, the top producer. By far the most serious threat to global supplies come from Escondida, the biggest copper mine in the world where workers rejected owner BHP Group's final wage offer in voting last week, unless the two sides can reach a deal in government-mediated talks this week, the market may be left without production from a project that last year churned out 1.2 million metric tons. Two other smaller mines, Cadelco's Andina and JX Nippon Mining and Metals Cazarones, 
are at the same stage in their collective bargaining, that puts upwards of 7% of world production at risk in a particularly sensitive moment in the metal cycle and in Chilean politics. Labor tensions are intensifying just as trillions of dollars in government stimulus fuel demand for industrial metals. Copper futures have gained over the past two weeks after retreating from an all-time high in May. And so we will see copper's latest price in our metal section, but I just wanted to highlight that because I thought that was a bit of a head turner. Turning to the Northern Miner, we have this story of uh, the battle for Norant heats up with BHP's $258 million bid. This is by Cecilia Jamasmi, and this is in the Ring of Fire, and BHP is making a bid for Norant Resources, uh, which owns a huge stake, as far as I understand, in Ontario's Ring of Fire. BHP has offered $325 million Canadian, $258 million US, for Canadian nickel miner Norant Resources, trumping a bid by Australian mining billionaire Andrew Forrest's Wailu Metals as top miners race to secure supplies of battery metals. You know, a quick thing here, like I think any critical metals or almost any metals that are industrial, which are almost all critical now, I personally think they should go under a national security review because at this point, we're not where we were 20 years ago. Like I think if any big takeover of anything by any foreign country and I like and you don't want to be protectionist, but you also don't want to give away everything at pennies on the dollar when they're out of favor. The world's largest miner is offering 55 cents per share of Norant, representing a premium of 129% to the company's closing price on May 21st, a day before Wailu's proposal. Norant is recommending shareholders accept the bid, which comes through BHP Lonsdale, a subsidiary that already owns 3.7% of the Canadian nickel miner, and we have a quote from Alan Coots, Norant CEO, quote, BHP has the financial strength, world-class mining expertise, and commitment to work in partnership with stakeholders to advance Eagle Nest and the Ring of Fire, which has the potential to deliver benefits to local communities, First Nations, and Ontario for years to come. BHP is speeding up its push into so-called future-facing commodities, including nickel, lithium, and copper, which are poised to benefit from the green energy transition. And we have a quote from BHP, Norant represents a growth opportunity in a prospective nickel basin capable of delivering a scalable new nickel sulfide district. It's funny how the messaging is different. Now we're reading excerpts here of each press release, but the Alan Coots from Norant is talking about how it'll benefit the community. And BHP is saying how this could be a new nickel district and this could be a a real boon to us. The company is also in the process of exiting thermal coal and is considering exiting the oil and gas sector as part of its commitment to reduce emissions. Wailu Metals, which is Norant's top shareholder with a 23% stake as of December 2020, had offered 31 cents per share for the stock it did not already hold in the company. Norant adopted a poison pill to stop the takeover. So BHP is offering 55 cents. Why Lu is offering 31.5 cents. BHP's offer comes on the heels of its decision to move the exploration team's headquarters to Toronto, Canada's most populous city. The company plans to almost double exploration spending for base metals within five years. You know, just a personal aside, I think Canada better wake up. You have the world's biggest miner. Is, they're starting to move offices to Canada because they see huge opportunity. And before you know it, it's all going to be sold. OK, now I don't know how many of these things or how many of these projects are actually owned by Canadian companies. And maybe this is just how it's done. But, you know, now about the project, Norant owns the early stage Eagle's Nest nickel and copper deposit in Ontario's Ring of Fire. It has been billed by Wailu as the largest high grade nickel discovery in Canada since the Boise's Bay nickel find in the eastern province of Newfoundland and Labrador. I mean, we have to wake up. I, like, I think Canadian politicians have to see and just the mining community like i see two australian companies battling it out here uh so where are the canadian companies and are we just again like if you have a world-class nickel and copper deposit in ontario's ring of fire the largest high-grade nickel discovery in canada since voices bay i mean at this point isn't it a national security issue you know, I just bring it up. I mean, feel free. To, I don't say this with any deep conviction. I just, to me, it, this seems like a little, 
uh, are we asleep at the wheel? And maybe we're not, but I think we have to ask ourselves this question as Canadians. Eagle's Nest is expected to begin commercial production in 2026 with the mine running initially for 11 years. The mine's start date has repeatedly been pushed back by Noront due to successive federal and provincial governments' inability to consult and reach unanimous agreement with First Nations in the area. Bill Gallagher is an expert on this, and really because the First Nations actually run the show when it comes to these projects. So everything's on their terms. So th this is an interesting wrinkle in this story. Nickel production would need to increase nearly fourfold. And skipping down a bit, BHP's offer coincides with Canada's push to position the country as a hub for clean tech metals. The bid is conditional on acceptance by more than 50% of Noron's common shares, excluding a small stake that BHP already owns. So, you know, I'm sure BHP is a pretty competent and I, we've seen their, we've covered their CEO in conference calls. They seem thoughtful. But remember when BHP tried to take over a potash mine in Saskatchewan and the government stepped in? My only question is, is potash that different from nickel? And you could argue, you can make the argument that it is. It's food, right? What do we do if we can't grow food? That is a little bit closer to home. But I would argue in our technological world, nickel really isn't that far behind. Yeah. So I just leave it at that. I mean, I'm not saying this with any sort of deep conviction here, but I, it raises a lot of questions to me about, again, just selling off resources, you know, for three. And, and I guess this is my issue for three hundred and twenty five million dollars Canadian. OK, or U.S. two hundred and fifty eight million dollars U.S. That is the issue. Like. We just saw Rio Tinto give a $9.1 billion dividend because they they have too much money. They're picking up this jewel, the biggest nickel project since Voices Bay in Canada, for $258 million. So am I wrong? So I just leave that for you, uh, you to call your politician about if you feel similar. This raises a lot of concern. Okay. Again, if it's going for $3 billion, $10 billion, $50 billion, fine. $258 million, uh, what's that? Like, I mean, you can buy a community, a neighborhood in Toronto could buy this mine. Okay, like, uh, like if they pooled their money together. Continuing on, Cameco, they have had a significant loss. I listened to their conference call. I almost posted it as our content today, but let's see. We may do it next week. Uh, there is some new stuff in there. We'll see. But yes, they have a Q2 loss that was significant, a 32% drop in revenue as uranium contract business grow. So they're making more contracts, but they're not seeing that in their revenue. It's by Henry Lazenby. Canada's largest uranium producer, Cameco, says it has managed to narrow its June quarter headline loss despite a 32% drop in overall revenue. The quarter also saw its long-term uranium supply contract portfolio expand. In addition to the 9 million pounds of uranium oxide and long-term sales contracts finalized in April, Cameco added another 7 million pounds under contract in the latest three-month period, it brought the total volume contracted in the year to date to 16 million pounds. It still pales in comparison to peak contracting that followed the 2007 price peak at $137 per pound. The adjusted loss for the three months ended June 30th were $38 million, or 10 cents per share, compared with a loss of $65 million in the second quarter of 2020. Analysts on average expected Cameco to post a net loss of 3 cents per share on $379 million of revenue. So significantly lower, according to financial data firm Refinitiv, revenues fell to $359 million from $525 million a year earlier. So it's really interesting because we saw uranium stocks take off without the metal taking off. According to Tim Gitzel, the company's CEO, the company is taking the, quote, necessary steps, end quote, including investing in digital and automation technologies, quote, that will allow us to align our production decisions with our contract portfolio. I get the sense that Tim Gitzel is doing everything he can, but he is just stuck with a low uranium price. Uranium spot prices are trending higher above $30 per pound and ended June at $32.30 per pound, according to UXC data. 
So it's gone nowhere for years, the uranium price. Now, interestingly, as of Wednesday afternoon, the company's Toronto quoted equity traded 4.5% higher at $22.44 per share, capitalizing it at $8.92 billion. I mean, Rio Tinto could have bought Cameco with their dividend. Think about that. Their, their market capitalization is $8.92 billion for Cameco. So if, if they were offered $13 billion, are we going to allow Cameco to be taken over too? Because that's kind of what I see with Norant. And this is after shares are up 38.5% after hitting period high of $26.80. So, you know, another company with incredible, arguably the world's best assets, but among the world's best uranium assets in a very, very, very safe jurisdiction. I mean, it doesn't really get much safer than Saskatchewan. And trading at a huge discount. Like Again, if Rio Tinto comes in and says, we want to be in uranium to promote our ESG, because uranium is now being filed by the EU as a sustainable metal or a sustainable industry, are we going to let that one go to, to whoever just bids us a few billion more with all that money that's sloshing around? Continuing on, Here's in reverse, we have a Canadian company, Barrick Gold, signs four exploration deals in Egypt. So they're expanding into Egypt. This is by Cecilia Jamazmi. Barrick Gold has inked four gold exploration deals in Egypt's eastern desert, the country's Ministry of Petroleum and Mineral Resources said today. The miner, which won an international tender Egypt launched last year, will explore in 19 new blocks in the eastern desert with an estimated total investment of $8.8 million. So it sounds like first steps. I mean, eight million dollars today. Again, like uh, that's like four houses in Toronto. So Barrick is investing four houses in Toronto worth of money into Egypt. Like it seems like a drop in the bucket, doesn't it? And think about again. Think about housing prices, and think about that story again. Three hundred twenty-five million dollars. Let's say a Toronto house probably goes for two million dollars now. So 160 houses in Toronto is what you can buy Noron's Eagle Nest Nickel Copper Project, which is seen by some as the biggest nickel project since Voices Bay, at least in Canada. So kind of makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah, so Barrick expands into Egypt. And so those are your news stories. And now let's take a look at metal prices. We'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on August 3rd, to set the table, the 10-year bond is trading at 1.184%. That is 0.07% lower. So bond yields continue to decline while gold is trading at $1,810.37 per ounce. That is $14 higher. Then last week, silver is trading at $25.46 per ounce. That is $0.29 cents higher than last week. And platinum is trading at $1,059.90 per ounce. That is $2 higher than last week. And palladium is trading at $2,696.48 per ounce. That is $48 higher than last week. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading at $4.42 per pound. That is 14 cents higher than last week. Aluminum is six cents higher at $1.19 per pound. That is the highest we have seen it uh, by a good five cents. The previous high we had was about five weeks ago when it was $1.14. So now it's $1.19 per pound. Turning to lead, it is unchanged at $1.10, also a two-year high from when we have been recording these prices. Nickel has broken $9 at $9.02 per pound, as in Noront Resources, Ring of Fire Nickel, at $9.02 per pound. That is $0.28 cents higher than last week and also the highest level we have seen since we've began 
according to these prices, two years ago. Tin has broken $16 at $16.31 per pound. That is 39 cents higher than last week and also an all-time high since we started recording these weekly prices two years ago. Cobalt is at $23.78 per pound. That is two cents lower than last week. And zinc is on par with its previous all-time high from the last two years at $1.38 per pound. That is four cents higher. So what do we see? Not much to see in gold and silver or platinum or palladium. Nothing to write home about in the precious metals. Industrial metals looks like they've broken up to new highs. And so this transitory narrative is getting a little long in the tooth, isn't it? Like the scenario that I see that's kind of scary is what if the 10-year bond is telling us we're heading into recession just as commodity prices are going even higher as we hit inflation, which sounds like stagflation. As far as I understand it, low growth and high inflation. So a bit of a freaky setup, but uh, that's where we are as it stands. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have Rio Tinto's Q2 conference call with CEO Jacob Staussholm and Rio Tinto's Chief Financial Officer Peter Cunningham. There are excerpts. I cut out Peter Cunningham's really in-depth look at the numbers. So I left about a two or three second pause in between so that you can tell there's a break. And they talk about how there's rising demand out of China. They talk about their desire to have impeccable ESG credentials. They are very excited. They talk twice about their new battery metals deposit that they're trying to start and invest in in Serbia, the Yater deposit. They don't mention the controversy over it, as I discussed in the introduction. So that's worth looking up on. We have an article in the Northern Miner about that. So you can see that. Either way, you're going to find this very educational as we tour through the major company conference calls in earnings season here, which is giving us a really bleeding edge look at what is actually happening from these incredibly profitable mining companies. And Rio Tinto offering, again, a $9.1 billion dividend. So with that, I hope you enjoy it and we'll see you on the other side. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good evening. When I presented our results in February, I set out a pathway to make Rio Tinto stronger, building on what are clearly fundamentally robust foundations. To me, our performance this half reaffirmed the underlying qualities of Rio Tinto. It also highlighted the need to strengthen the business for the long term. We again achieved a strong safety performance, despite challenging conditions. It remains our first priority, and we will never be complacent. Government stimulus to aid economic recovery in response to ongoing COVID pressures led to robust demand for our products at a time of ongoing supply constraints. As a result, we saw significant and prolonged price spikes during the first half, leading to strong free cash flow. As an industry, we benefited from host governments recognizing mining as an essential business. It allowed us to focus on safely operating our world-class assets and delivering products to our customers despite necessary COVID restrictions. This meant people remained employed, suppliers had our business, and taxes and royalties continued to be paid. And our people once again demonstrated their agility, resilience, and commitment to Rio. This is particularly true in terms of dealing with COVID. In 2020, we scrambled to keep our operations running. In 2021, COVID has been even more challenging, especially in terms of our ability to get people to our assets. This is particularly true in Mongolia and in Western Australia. However, 
our fundamentally strong foundations enable us to achieve EBDA of 21 billion and return on capital employed of 50%. We recorded 7.3 billion of taxes, have invested 3.3 billion in growth and sustaining capex, leading to a free cash flow in excess of $10 billion. As a result, we will return 9.1 billion to our shareholders. This is in line with our dividend practices and reflects a strong pricing environment. However, we remain cautious on the outlook and must ensure we remain resilient in all scenarios. In June, I was very pleased to be able to travel to our Yadar project in Serbia, meeting with some key stakeholders and visit the team on the ground. This week, I'm proud that we have committed funding for Yadar. This is an important step forward, moving Rio Tinto into battery materials at scale. It also demonstrates our commitment to invest in capital in a disciplined manner to shape our portfolio for the future. Lithium is a key commodity for the electrification of transport, large-scale batteries, and energy storage. We have a critical role in supplying the metals and minerals required for the global energy transition. Despite our outstanding financial performance the past six months, has confirmed that there clearly are areas where we need to improve. Firstly, to be the best operator. In the first half, we experienced too much operational instability. We are addressing this in a systemic manner and will sharpen the consistency of our performance. Secondly, the 100 plus stakeholder meetings I have had in the first half have just strengthened my conviction that the foundation for our business is to achieve applicable ESG credentials. In order to sustainable deliver shareholder returns, we must ensure all our stakeholders benefit from the success of Rio Tinto. Thirdly, we must excel in development, both organically and inorganically. We will only pursue opportunities that create value. Yara is a perfect example. And then finally, we must become a more outward-looking company, more in tune with society. This is our social li license to operate. It's judged by others and essential to, for long-term success. We are making tangible and lasting changes to the way we engage, interact, and operate. This goes beyond my leadership team and is being embedded across the entire company to ensure we are making sustainable changes. Let me now hand over to Peter to take you through the financials. Thank you, Jakob, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Let's first turn to the markets. All our commodities benefited from strong demand globally. Growth in China slowed but remained robust. In the rest of the world, stimulus and the gradual easing of COVID-19 restrictions boosted consumption of our products. The iron ore price continues to confound most market commentators' predictions. This was driven by a surge in global demand, while supply struggled to keep pace. China's first half steel demand was up 9% year on year, with the construction and automotive sectors both performing well. Consumption was also robust across the rest of the world, where demand recovered by 15% compared with the first half of last year. Meanwhile, iron ore supply from the majors continued to lag expectations, with high cost production balancing the market. Scrap is now recovering from the lows in 2020 with global first-half consumption set to rise 18% as crude steel output and scrap availability improve. These factors led to the iron ore price more than doubling in the first half of 2021. However, with tightening credit conditions and a softer housing market in China, coupled with expectations for rising seaborne supply, it seems unlikely that such elevated pricing will persist. Turning to our other commodities, aluminium 
has been supported by tight physical markets with elevated LME and premia and strong demand in global semis, up 8% versus last year. Supply disruptions in China and limited restarts elsewhere have translated into price gains of around 41%. Copper prices have rallied 66%, driven by multi-year weakness in supply growth, with mine supply up just 1% and a strong recovery in global demand. We also saw strong end-use demand for TiO2 across all regions, with pigment prices and utilization rates increasing throughout the first half. Now on to our financial results. We've announced a very strong set of financials against the backdrop of an unprecedented recovery in global demand. It was also a very clean set of results, with few exceptional items and no impairments. Starting with revenue, the 71% increase was mostly driven by price, in particular iron ore. The resultant increase in profitability lifted our return on capital to 50% and underlying earnings to $12.2 billion, just below the level we recorded for the 2020 full year. Free cash flow amounted to $10.2 billion. And this was after a $1.2 billion outflow related to working capital, mostly as a result of higher price levels flowing through receivables. And $3.3 billion on capital expenditure, up 24% year on year. The board was therefore able to declare total dividends per share of 561 US cents, which I'll come on to a bit later. Finally, on to shareholder return. Our policy, well known to most of you, dates back to 2016. We commit to returning 40 to 60% of underlying earnings on average through the cycle, with additional returns to shareholders in periods of strong earnings and cash generation. As you can see from this chart, over the last five years, we've consistently exceeded our policy, with an average payout ratio of 73%. The first half of 2021 is no exception. We have always said the key decision point is around the final dividend. However, given the strength of our balance sheet and the extremely buoyant markets, we have announced today an interim ordinary dividend of $6.1 billion and a $3 billion special dividend. This brings the payout ratio for this year to 75%. On that note, let me pass back to Jakob. Thank you, Peter. During the past 12 months, governments around the world have become increasingly aligned in their focus on the transition to a lower carbon world. This transition will require more of everything we produce and underpins the demand for our commodities for the decades to come. The images on this slide demonstrates exactly why. Many people see solar cells, wind turbines, transmission lines, and electrical vehicles. I see a huge need not just for copper, aluminium, and battery materials, but also iron ore. This is additional or new demand, supplementary to long-established expectations of ongoing population growth and urbanization, the main drivers of historical commodity consumption. What is also becoming clear in my mind is that societal expectations of how these materials are extracted will continue to evolve driving scrutiny around transparency, CO2 footprint, and how companies treat customers, communities, suppliers, and employees. It reinforces why we have decided to focus on the four key areas I highlighted earlier. Our operational performance clearly isn't where it has been in the past or where we want it to be. Ensuring we once again become the best operator is about restoring the utensils' DNA. Similarly, 
We have a proud track record of delivering projects on time and on budget and deploying our balance sheet to create long-term value and shared prosperity. Today's strong financial performance reflects the courage of leaders decades ago to invest in the iron ore business, which was not as profitable then as it is now. Finally, and importantly, we need to ensure that we are seen as a crucial and integral part of society. To truly unleash our full potential, we need to be more outward looking. This is firstly about earning and protecting our social license. Clearly, this must happen wherever we operate. However, given the significance of Australia to Rio Tinto, I spent three and a half months there earlier this year. I engaged extensively across Australia from our traditional owners in the Pilbara and the Northern Territory to key government representatives, business leaders, and our shareholders. I also met many current and former Rio employees. It was an opportunity to listen, to learn, and understand how we need to adapt. While some meetings were confronting, a key thing for me is that I did not meet a single person who did not want to see Rio Tinto succeed. I've also met stakeholders in China, New Zealand, South Africa, Serbia, Canada, and Brussels. We have taken the insights from these meetings and are applying them to how we behave and operate globally. This isn't just about building capacity and strengthening governance, which are clearly important, but it's also how we engage in a respectful and collaborative manner. It's going to take time and great effort to rebuild trust, but I'm absolutely committed to doing this. One of the attributes that attracted me to Rio Tinto was the company's long-standing commitment to how it operated beyond the financial performance. I'm often challenged internally and externally about exactly what I mean by impeccable ESG credentials. What I do know is that safety has always been core to how we operate. I know that every Rio Tinto employee recognizes good, bad, and impeccable safety performance. And nothing short of impeccable is acceptable. I want to bring the same focus we have on safety to all areas of ESG. We will focus on real engagement with our communities, understanding their experience and never forgetting that in so many places, we are guests on their land. By being more transparent and modernizing multiple agreements, I recognize there will be some tension and testing times ahead, but it is vital that we get this right. When I sat down to choose my leadership team, getting people with the right values was crucial to ensure we build a stronger and more engaged organization. But it needs to go deeper into the business. We are therefore implementing leadership and cultural awareness coaching to an extended team. The key to achieving consistent operational excellence is our people. We will start by unlocking real and sustainable improvement at each asset. <clears throat> this is a great opportunity, which we are pursuing with rigor. Focusing solely on top-down processes and system solutions will not deliver sustained value. We will lead in a more supportive, inclusive, and people-focused way. Each of our product groups have contributed to the early framework design and identified pilot sites where the Rio Tinto safe production system will initially be rolled out. Now, turning to our portfolio, we need to remain relevant and be well-placed to meet the commodity needs of future generations. We will build the capabilities in project development, evaluation, and execution. Our portfolio should not be seen through a quarterly lens, but in terms of decades. Our history has demonstrated an ability to renew the portfolio, and we will continue to do so within our capital allocation framework. In addition, we continue to further strengthen our project pipeline through our sector-leading exploration activity. 
Turning to oil, Tolgoy, despite considerable COVID-related challenges, the team has done a great job. We have made considerable progress and all project-related technical criteria to support undercut commencement have been achieved. We are working on other elements, such as government permitting, that will enable us to proceed. We continue to engage with the government and have remobilized our negotiation teams following the recent presidential elections. There remains a clear shared goal, as expressed by the government, to move oil tolgoy forward. I'm confident that we will be able to find a mutually acceptable solution to allow this impressive development to deliver for all stakeholders, including the people of Mongolia. The Yadar project marks an exciting entry for Rio Tinto into battery minerals at scale. The market fundamentals for lithium are strong, with 25 to 35 percent demand growth per annum projected over the next 10 years, driven by the global energy transition. As one of the world's largest new greenfield lithium projects on the doorstep of the European Union, Yadar will be well placed to meet this demand. Yadda will produce battery-grade lithium carbonate, a critical mineral used in large-scale batteries for electrical vehicles and storing renewable energy. It could power over 1 million electric vehicles a year. It will also it will be a direct and indirect catalyst for the Serbian economy, creating over 2,000 construction jobs and 1,000 ongoing jobs when operational. We are working hard to establish trusting and respectful relationships with local communities, including landowners, the Serbian government, and other stakeholders. Subject to receiving all relevant approvals, licenses, and ongoing engagement with local communities, construction will commence in 2022, with first production in 2026. We are excited about lithium and developing the Yadda project. So let me summarize. Our safety performance remained strong, but we are not complacent. Our people and world-class asset delivered outstanding financial results driven by very supportive commodity markets. Our balance sheet enables us to invest in a disciplined way where we see attractive opportunities like Yadda. There's definitely room for improvement to build on these foundations. We have identified and are addressing what needs to be done. And I look forward to providing you further insights at our Capital Markets Day later in the year. In the meantime, we are all focused each day on making Rio Tinto even stronger. There you have it, Rio Tinto's Q2 conference call. It's been very interesting to watch this company develop over the last couple of years as we've done this podcast through scandal and now through uh, incredible profits. The plot thickens and we will continue to follow Rio Tinto through it all. I hope you're having a wonderful summer. You're getting out there on vacation. And if you want to help out the podcast, please leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. And until next week, take care.